Thank you very much, Katia, for the uh, invitation and giving me the opportunity. And uh, I would like to thank all the audience for uh, attending the talk. And I ask them to please interrupt if they have any questions or comments. OK, so <clears throat> I'm going to uh, start the talk by First, uh, introducing the problem we are interested in the talk, and then I'm gonna give uh, just a little bit of a survey of the results that are known. And uh, after that, I will introduce the new result. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll be mainly interested in two inverse problems. One I call inverse Laplace spectral problem, and the other one I call inverse length spectral problem. And we are only interested in plane domains. Okay, so you are familiar with the first one, I'm sure, maybe not with the second problem because the second one is more like a dynamical problem. The first problem is the famous Katz problem there to, uh, that says determine the shape of a domain from the spectrum of the Laplacian with boundary conditions such as Dirichlet or Neumann. The second problem <clears throat> uh, is completely dynamical and is asking to uh, determine uh, a domain from the length spectrum. And the length spectrum is just the length of periodic billiard trajectories. Okay. I see that uh, Steve is here. All right, that's nice. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> these are the two problems we are interested in, and mainly the first problem is the one I'm interested, but there is a lot of activity in the second problem, namely the uh, determining a domain from the length of spectrum that I will talk about a few uh, important results in this subject as well. So let me rephrase the question uh, by uh, just asking it differently. So uh, let's look at the map, the spectral map. Uh, either for the spectrum of the Laplacian or the length spectrum. Okay, and uh, we restrict ourselves to a class of domains. Right now, it's just very vague. And when I say class of domains, of course, uh, I mean isometry equivalence classes. Okay, because if the if two domains are isometric, they have the same spectrum, and um, so we're modding it out by the, by the isometries. Sometimes we restrict ourselves to a class of smooth domains or analytic domains, but right now it's just very vague. Okay, so this is the, the rephrase that I, uh, I like to uh, impose. If we fix a domain omega in, the, in a class of domains, and we want to uh, understand the structure of all domains that are isospectral, namely the isospectral class to omega. So this would be the inverse image of the spectrum by the spectrum map. And you can ask many questions about this uh, isospectral class. Is this class equal just to a single uh, uh, set, namely the single domain omega. That would be ideal. That would say that this uh, omega is spectrally unique within the class of domains D. Or, uh, well, that's, that's such a strong statement. If you can prove such a thing, that would be, that would be very ideal. And, or you can uh, weaken that and the questions I'm asking here, they just get weaker and weaker. So 
we can ask, is it, is it a finite set? That would be also very nice if you can prove uh, that the, the ISO spectral class mod, of course, modulus the isometries is finite. And of course, uh, the class D, you don't want it to be too, too small. We, we like it to be infinite dimensional or finite dimensional, but, uh, but infinite dimensional would be better. And, uh, or you could ask another question, is it, is it discrete? Or uh, how, is omega isolated? That means that nearby, there are no isospectral domains. The near, near, locally near omega, there are no either uh, isospectral domains. If it's not isolated, you could ask, is there a continuous curve uh, in the isospectral class that passes through omega? Again, you can weaken that to the C1 curve or even an analytic curve. You could, of course, add your own questions here. I'm not asking all possible questions uh, that uh, there are many interesting questions you can ask. And finally, maybe the, the weakest one is the isospectral class compact in a certain topology. Okay. So basically, these are the questions that people in the inverse spectral theory have been interested. And I'm gonna go over the results we know in the field that, uh, that uh, refer to, to, to some of these questions. Okay. Uh, uh, you, uh, we mentioned Kak's question that, uh, the Kak's question is asking whether two, uh, two planes that are isospectral, they're isometric and uh, I think most of you know that uh, the answer is negative. All counterexamples, however, consist of non-convex polygons. <clears throat> but uh, regarding a spectral uniqueness <clears throat> among all the smooth domains, there are some results. Um, there are three that, that, uh, that we know. One is the original paper of Katz that he proved using the heat trace invariance and the isopyramidic inequality that the round disk is spectrally determined among all, in fact, the smoothness could be relaxed to uh, Lipschitz even, but back then maybe it was just, uh, it was a little, it was uh, smooth. So, uh, that was the first result that you can spectrally determine among all domains. Okay, that's the ideal uh, situation. And uh, there are some results by Watanabe. And uh, he also uses heat trace invariance and he proves uh, the existence of certain nearly circular domains that are spectrally unique among all the smooth domains. So these these examples are non-explicit. And uh, recently with Zeldich, we proved nearly circular ellipses are spectrally unique among all the smooth domains. Uh, and in this theorem, we use some, some uh, results of um, uh, Avila, Kaloshin, and Sorrentino uh, in the field of uh, dynamics of the billiard. Okay, so I'm not listing the, uh, the, uh, the previous results uh, in the order they appear. I'm listing them based on the questions I raised here. So that list you saw, it was uh, about the first question, whether the isospectral class is just one single element. Okay, and uh, so the next, type of questions are, uh, that, that exist in the literature are local uniqueness results. So this is a weaker inverse problem, of course. We want to uh, find domains that are locally spectrally unique, meaning that they can be heard among nearby domains in a C infinity topology. 
the first result of this, this type was by Mar uh, Marvizi and Melrose. They constructed a two parameter family of domains and uh, which they resemble ellipses and they were hoping that they were ellipses but they cannot prove their ellipses. Uh, that, that they show this two parameter family uh, are locally and spectrally unique in the C infinity topology. Another uh, result, which is about the second question I asked, and this is purely dynamical, this is about length of spectral rigidity. It's, uh, it follows from a result of Kaloshin and Sorrentino, and uh, they have a bigger result, but it's kind of like a corollary of that. They prove that ellipses, these are not nearly circular necessary. Ellipses are locally marked length spectrally unique among all the smooth domains. Okay, so marked length spectrum. I introduced the length spectrum being the length of periodic orbits. Marked length spectrum, you want to know the number of bounces of the billiard trajectory when it, and, and also the winding number. So that's why it's called marked. You mark them by the, the number of uh, reflections and the winding number. So this is another local uniqueness result, that if you are nearly elliptical, then the marked length spectrum determines, uh, and you have the same marked length, length spectrum as the ellipse, then the, the domain has to be the ellipse. <clears throat> okay, so we're getting to weaker uh, inverse problems. Next one would be, uh, the spectral rigidity. So this is weaker than local spectral uniqueness. And uh, usually we assume, uh, so we have a deformation, isospectral deformation that we like to show is trivial. And this isospectral deformation, uh, usually C1, but sometimes it's uh, analytic deformation or sometimes it could be C0 deformation, okay. Uh, so I start with the result of Colin de Verdier that he proved analytic domains with the symmetries of the ellipse. And the uh, symmetries of the ellipse, I just mean the reflection of symmetries, up, down, left, right symmetry. Their length is very rigid within the class within the class of analytic domains. And in fact, he, uh, he only studies the, the lengths that are near the bouncing ball orbit. Uh, more precisely, he studies the, the Birkhoff normal form uh, of the bouncing ball orbit. And uh, so, so he proves his, uh, in his, it is actually a marked length aspect of rigidity result. And, uh, but once you have a deformation, you don't have to mark them. They, they automatically are marked. So, uh, so he proves a length of spectral rigidity for such class of domains. Uh, with uh, Zeldich, we proved uh, another version of a spectral rigidity called infinitesimally a spectral, a spectral rigidity. So, this says that the, uh, when, whenever you have a isospectral deformation of, of an ellipse, and this is true smooth domains, not analytic, and again, assuming the two axial symmetries of the ellipse, then the first variation vanishes. In fact, you can use that argument, you can use that and argue that the you cannot have an analytic one parameter family of isospectral domains with the two symmetries of the ellipse <clears throat> uh, going through the ellipse. Okay, so this rules out analytic curves in the isospectral class of the ellipse among the smooth domains with the two axial symmetries of the ellipse. There is also a result of Popov and, and Topolov that uh, ellipses are length 
or sorry, our Laplace is spectral rigid within the class of analytic domains with the two axial symmetries of an ellipse. So here it's not infinitesimal rigidity, it's a little stronger, it's actually rigidity that they show the, that uh, the C1 curve of isospectral deformations has to be uh, has to be trivial. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, recently in, a, in our paper with Zeldich, where we proved uh, a result about uh, a spectral uh, uniqueness of nearly sequel ellipses, we also actually, our result also shows uh, a corollary of a result of decimoi, Kaloshin, and Wei that uh, nearly circular domains, and these are smooth, uh, not analytic necessarily, nearly circular domains with one axial symmetry are spectrally rigid among such domains. It, it uses a, a heavily a result of the Simoy Kaloshin and Way. But their result was about length of spectrum. They proved the length of spectral rigidity and uh, we relate it by the Poisson relation to the Laplace uh, spectrum. And uh, that's how we prove our theorem as a corollary of, uh, of, of a theorem we have in, in our new paper. Okay, uh, so uh, finally, there is uh, another setting which is interesting and uh, there are some results You want to restrict the class of domains D so that uh, you have a, the spectrum map is one to one. Okay. So instead of look at uh, only working in the as, as, uh, space in the class of all the smooth domains, uh, we just want to restrict ourselves to a smaller class. Uh, in fact analytic domains. So this class could be infinite to the results that are that are in the subject. Uh, the class D is either infinite dimensional or it's finite dimensional. When it's infinite dimensional, it's uh, usually we have a generic property added to the class because otherwise it's a difficult problem to, to prove it for the entire uh, class of, under consideration. But if any is finite dimensional, then you don't want to add a, gener uh, a generic assumption because it's kind of trivial otherwise. So uh, the first result uh, for the uh, uh, bounded plane domains in this category of questions uh, was uh, proved by uh, Zeldich that uh, in fact, he had an earlier result for Domain, analytic domains with two symmetries, but then he got rid of one symmetry. And he proves that generic analytic domains with one axial symmetry are spectrally distinguishable from each other. So the spectral map is one-to-one. -one. He also proved the result for dihedral do, uh, domains, domains with dihedral symmetries in the same paper. Uh, for finite dimensional results, uh, they, they uh, almost all of them, they only uh, work on uh, po uh, polygons. Dorso, uh, in her thesis, she, uh, she proved that triangles can be heard among other triangles. And uh, also with uh, Zichen Liu and Julie Rowlett, we uh, studied this problem for trapezoids and we proved that they are spectrally unique among them among themselves. So there is no genetic assumptions in these settings. Okay, so now he, I want to state the new result, which actually is uh, similar to the result of Zeldich that I mentioned here. And this is about centrally symmetric analytic domains. A domain is centrally symmetric if it's invariant under the isometric involution, just that just uh, reflects 
uh, domain about the origin. The picture on the left is the centrally symmetric domain. And the picture on the right is up-down symmetric domain. The result of Zeldich uh, that I mentioned from 2009 is studied uh, up-down symmetric analytic domains. So here we want to study centrally symmetric domains. They're both Z2 symmetric. Z2 meaning that uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the symmetry group is just Z2 for both of them, but they're different obviously. They're different symmetries. One can easily prove, I have a slide at the end if there is time, that every simply connected, centrally symmetric bounded plane domain has at least one bouncing ball orbit that is invariant under, uh, under the, the isometric involution I introduced here, sigma, just a ref reflection about the origin. So, and we always align the bouncing ball orbit to lie on the y-axis. So I'm drawing that here in blue. For the up-down symmetric domain, it's very easy to show there is always a bouncing ball orbit, but for centrally symmetric, there is, you just have to uh, work a little bit and it's quite easy to show there is always one bouncing ball orbit. In fact, most of the time there are two. If it's convex, there, there are actually two bouncing ball orbits. And I want the bouncing ball orbit to go through the origin, the origin, so that it's invariant under the, the, the isometric involution. Okay, so you can see, so we're going to imp, uh, introduce a parallel result to a result of Zeldich. And uh, to introduce the class, as I said, it's gonna be a generic class. Uh, I have to introduce uh, some notions. Let me talk about the Poincare map. The linear Poincare map is the linearization of the first return map. Uh, okay, and uh, we say that the, the bouncing ball orbit is non-degenerate if the determinant of I minus the Poincare map is not zero. So namely one is not an eigenvalue of the Poincare map. The orbit, the bouncing ball orbit is elliptic if the, if the eigenvalues are of this form, e to the i alpha, e to the minus i alpha. And I always assume alpha is in this range. Alpha is not zero because I'm assuming it is non-degenerate. And uh, it's hyperbolic if the eigenvalues are of this form, they're real. And this form, and I always assume alpha is positive. Now I, uh, I can introduce the class uh, on which we show the, the, the spectrum map is one-to-one. -one. Locally near the bouncing ball orbit, as I said, you always, we always align it on the y-axis. The boundary on the top and the bottom can be a, a, is graphical on the x-axis. So you can write it as on the top, I always use f. And because it's centrally symmetric, you reflect it down, you get a minus sign. And that's the reflection uh, about, uh, so you get a minus sign here, another minus sign for reflecting the X. So there are two minus signs. The bottom function would be minus F of minus X. That's obvious. If it's up down symmetric, you wouldn't have this minus sign, just a minus sign here. But if it's uh, centrally symmetric, this is how the bottom function is related to the top function. This is the class DL. It's kind of, it's, a, it's marked by this L. Okay, so L is fixed. And uh, this is the class of simply connected, centrally symmetric, real analytic domains satisfying these four properties. First, we want to have a non-degenerate bouncing ball of length 2L, okay? And we want that length, the length of that bouncing ball and twice of that length 
which corresponds to gamma and the second iteration of gamma, we want them to have multiplicity one in the length spectrum. We, we want to be able to hear those lengths. And uh, we also want the third order Taylor coefficient of f to be non-zero. This is called a non-vertex assumption. So the, 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 where the bouncing ball reflects, we, we want to have non-vertices non non at those point of impacts. Also, when the orbit is elliptic, we want, uh, which as we said, the eigenvalues are in this form, we don't want alpha to belong to this simple set. Zero pi over three and pi, that's it. So this is a bad set and we like, we don't want alpha to be in that set. So you see, we are removing some things like alpha being here or this being zero or these lengths not being simple or the orbit being degenerate. Uh, we believe this would be an open dense condition on the class, but, but definitely it's generic. So these are generic assumptions that we are adding uh, to our class of uh, centrally symmetric real analytic domains. And this is the, the main theorem that for Dirichlet Neumann, the map is one to one on the class I just introduced. This result was actually motivated by a recent paper of Bialy and Mironov. Uh, it's a purely dynamical result that centrally symmetric C2 convex plane domains, sorry, a centrally symmetric C2 convex plane domain, which is foliated in a neighborhood of the boundary by, uh, by caustics of rotation number less than or equal one over four. And so this is actually, it's not a complete foliation near the boundary by the caustics. If you, this is related to the Birkhoff conjecture in dynamical systems. So if you know that, then you, you should be able to understand this statement here. Uh, it's not a complete foliation. It's just foliation uh, near the boundary between the invariant curves of four linked orbits and the boundary. And they don't have any analyticity assumption. It's just C2. And they show that it must be an ellipse. So well, first we thought that we can uh, use this result and prove an inverse result for ellipses. But, uh, but then uh, we realized that there are some uh, difficulties there. But then uh, we noticed that uh, one could use the earlier result of Zeldich for the, uh, uh, where he used the up-down symmetry to, to get a result for, for uh, centrally symmetric domains. Of course, our statement is not about ellipses and it's just a generic class of uh, simply, uh, simply connected centrally symmetric analytic domains. But originally we were motivated by this and it would be nice to be able to use this result to prove an inverse result for ellipses. Okay, so to get to the, how one can prove a theorem like this, most, uh, not all, but most results uh, uh, about the inverse spectral theory of plane domains, they use the, the wave trace. They are results, as I mentioned, use the heat trace like the Wat Watanabe results or uh, even Katz result or the compactness results, they use the heat trace, but uh, the other results, they use the, the wave trace. And this is a Poisson relation that says that the singular support of the wave trace, I'm looking at the trace of the, the even wave operator here. So cosine of T is square root of Laplacian. As you know, the sum converges as a temperate distribution and uh, you ask what's the singular support of that distribution. The Poisson relation says that it's always a subset of the closure of the length spectrum plus minus length spectrum union zero. Okay, and uh, we don't know if equality holds. 
<clears throat> yeah. And okay, so this just says the singularity is a is a length, but what type of singularity is it? So this uh, this was a study uh, in a general setting of uh, non-degenerate periodic orbits whose lengths are simple by Gilman and Melrose. The state may, you may have seen of Gilman and Melrose is a singularity expansion, but if you just take the Fourier transform of that, this is what you get. You get uh, you get an statement in this form. So suppose you have a periodic orbit, doesn't have to be a bouncing ball, non-degenerate, and its length is simple. We choose a cutoff near that length that equals one near that length and doesn't include, epsilon is small enough, that doesn't include any other length. Then we multiply the wave trace. This is a local Fourier transform. It's like Fourier transform, but just localized near that length. And uh, we get an asymptotic expansion in, in inverse powers of k. So these coefficients you get here are, are going to be a spectral invariance, which we're going to take advantage of. But uh, before getting into that, which was studied uh, uh, by Zeldich extensively in the, in the paper I mentioned earlier, I'm going to focus on this a little bit for a few slides. This is called the symplectic prefactor. And uh, it was known before this result that, uh, uh, that, that this is basically the principal part of the wave trace. And uh, so let's focus on that a little bit. The symplectic prefactor turns out to be an expression like this. And then let's talk about all the ingredients here. The denominator is just the square root of the determinant of i minus the Poincare map. If it's non-degenerate, it's zero. So this is well defined. And uh, in the numerator here, you have e to the i pi over four, the Maslow index, uh, which is uh, a bit ambiguous here. And uh, you always get e to the i k the length. That's not very useful because we already know the length. The length for us is marked. This is a primitive length. Okay, for us is going also not that useful because that's also that's just two L, the primitive length of the iterations of the bouncing ball. And C zero is just universal, completely universal. And there is this uh, minus one. This number plus or minus one. For the Neumann case, this is just always one. And for the Dirichlet case, depends the number of reflections at the boundary. Okay. Uh, so this is an spectral invariant that we want to take advantage of. If you take absolute value of it, these, these things are modulus one, they go away. And uh, so basically the denominator is an spectral invariant. And then once that is an spectral invariant, this is an spectral invariant already because it's fixed. This is, this is, and these are also fixed. And this should be an spectral invariant modulus eight. Okay, so we wanna take advantage of these two. There's determinant and the Maslow index. We want to see whether alpha, do you, do you remember alpha it was, uh, if you have an elliptic orbit, e to the i alpha, e to the minus i alpha are the eigenvalues. If it's hyperbolic, e to the alpha and e to the minus alpha are the, are the eigenvalues. And we want to see whether those are spectral invariants. And of course, the first step would be to show that the second derivative of the top defining function is also an spectral invariant. Okay, so if you take the absolute value of the determinant of i minus Poincare map, just from the eigenvalues I told you, 
can easily find this and you get two minus two times cosine alpha in the elliptic case and two times cosine alpha minus two in the hyperbolic case. When the domain is up, down, or centrally symmetric, then the second order Taylor coefficient of the top function, which I use f plus, is minus the second derivative of the bottom function, which I call f minus. And in this case, actually, we have a simple formula that relates alpha to the second order Taylor coefficients. This is a standard in, a, in the theory of uh, billiards. For example, you can look at the book of Kozlov and Treshev for this equation. There is a more general one that you don't have to assume this assumption. Okay, so I'm, but, okay, so I'm just using, taking advantage of this equation here. So it's a simple relation between alpha and the second order Taylor coefficient. Okay, so there are two things. Is alpha an spectral invariant? If it is, then uh, you're tempted to put that in here and say, okay, then I solve this. If alpha is known, then I can solve for the second order Taylor coefficient and get uh, and find that the second order Taylor coefficient is also in a spectral invariant. But actually that's not uh, that obvious. Even alpha, so how do you determine alpha? If you look at this, it's true that if you have two domains and the both uh, bouncing orbits are elliptic, then these quantities are the same for both. And then you can determine cosine of alpha, alpha is from zero to pi, so you can determine alpha. But we don't know if both are elliptic or both are hyperbolic. It could be one orbit is elliptic, one orbit is hyperbolic, then you have to put this thing, such something like this equals something like that. So first I wanted this, I want to make sure both orbits are elliptic or both orbits of the two isolated spectral domains are hyperbolic. Then yes, alpha is determined. And I'll, we'll talk about that in the next slide. So suppose I got, somehow I got alpha as an spectral invariant, but then you have a quadratic equation whose roots are these. So there is a plus or minus and plus or minus. So you have two uh, uh, choices for the second order Taylor coefficient in terms of alpha. And uh, so, at the moment, we don't know this is an spectral invariant, even if alpha is, because you could have, for one domain, you could have with a plus sign, and the other domain, you could have with a minus sign. And what, so how are we going to uh, uh, distinguish these two and rule them out? It's going to be the Maslow index uh, that we saw in the prefactor. That's the one that is going to distinguish these uh, choices from each other. Okay, and uh, we'll talk about that. And also the Maslow index is going to distinguish elliptic and the hyperbolic orbits from each other. Okay, so before doing that, let me just say that this number plays a key role in our computations. At the moment it looks very random, but uh, it'll become very clear. Minus two times one plus L F double prime. It gives a nice description of elliptic and hyperbolic orbits that if it's elliptic, if and only if the absolute value is less than two and it's hyperbolic if the absolute value of this A is larger than two. It's a nice description in terms of this number A and also uh, becomes everywhere in our computations of the wave tracing variance. This number is negative if you choose a plus sign here and if it's a positive, you choose a minus sign here or here. Let's remember that too. And so, as I said, the Maslow index is going to, uh, to uh, break the tie, okay. Here is a formula for the Maslow index. Uh, it's not a very precise expression. If we could actually compute all of this, this LR and, and actually get a precise formula, but we don't need it. If you follow uh, uh, the result of Zeldich and uh, 
which eventually is a stationary phase lemma, at, uh, at some point, the phase function is going to be this uh, length functional, which I've introduced here. And you take the Hessian of that at this critical point, zero, 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 zero. Then basically you end up with the signature of the Hessian of that, uh, of this length functional. And the plus some other things that, that those numbers, one can easily see that they're, they only depend on R. So the mass of index is going to be a number that depends on R. In fact, it, it, is, it seems that it's just six R plus the signature of the Hessian. So that means this is an, if you know R, then this is an spectral invariant. So I'm just gonna focus on the signature of the Hessian. And let's just not talk about Maslow index, just talk about signature of the Hessian of this length function. This length function, actually two of them is plus and minus for the two orientations. So this is bouncing two R times, uh, up, down, up, down, up, down. And uh, it appears as a phase function in the oscillatory integral representation of the wave trace. So just a quick gl glance of that in one slide, I want to say this was proved by Zeldich that remember we had the wave trace and uh, we look at the Fourier transform, but localized near the length. The modulus, some lower order terms asymptotic in terms of the 2j minus two jet of f. These are Taylor coefficients of order less than equal to 2j minus two. He proved that the principal part is an oscillatory integral of this form whose phase is exactly the length function I introduced. The amplitude is also explicit, which I'm not going to write in terms of the length and the Hankel amplitude. And the Hankel amplitude is just universal. Okay. And then he applied the decision phase. There is a lot of work to, to just go from here to here, which uh, obviously I'm not going to talk about. Just this slide is just wants to tell you why this length function is important. It, it's because of this, that it just naturally appears as a phase function in the, in the parametrics of the wave trace. Okay, so, so I hope that you were convinced that this Hessian of the, that plays a key role. Anyone who's familiar with the session phase lemma, they know that uh, the inverse of the Hessian of the, the phase plays a key role in the asymptotic. So let's just call that H2R, okay? In fact, we are only interested in R equal one and R equal two. We don't care about any other R, just gamma and gamma square. It's very easy to compute the Hessian of that length function I introduced. For R equal one is this matrix and R equal two is this matrix. These are cyclic matrices. But uh, very easy to compute the eigenvalues for this is gonna be a plus two, a minus two. And for this, a plus two, a, a, a minus two. I'm, I'm uh, writing the eigenvalues because I wanna confine the signature of the Hessian. Signature means the number of positive eigenvalues minus the number of negative eigenvalues. And uh, if you compute, you get this, the signature of H2, is this, in the elliptic case, is always zero in the hyperbolic case, depending on whether that number A I introduced, you can see it again here, A, whether that number is larger than two or less than minus two, you get these two, and also these four cases. Okay, you see already signature of, signature of H2 tells you that the elliptic and hyperbolic cases can be distinguished from each other because in the elliptic case, the signature is zero, in the hyperbolic case is two or minus two. So both orbits have to be elliptic or both orbits have to be hyperbolic. And so then we can determine alpha as I talked earlier. To find F double prime, you can also, uh, you see that those are the cases that I mentioned, those plus or minus signs 
they would determine whether uh, <clears throat> A was positive or negative, and you can actually see, see that they are distinguished. So in the hyperbolic case, these two cases, those correspond to those possibilities of plus or minus sign in the, in the quadratic polynomial for F double prime. And they're distinguished because the index is two or minus two. In the elliptic case, again, positive A, they're distinguished here by two and minus two. So this is telling you how the, the signature of the Hessian uh, distinguishes those possibilities. And that shows this is an spectral invariant. So A is an spectral invariant in particular because A was completely in terms of, sorry, what did I do? Okay. A is completely determined in terms of F double prime and L. So A is an spectral invariant. If A is an spectral invariant, the inverse Hessian elements are also a spectral invariants. So let's keep that in mind the inverse Hessian, which comes in the decision phase lemma, there are spectral invariants as well. Okay, so I don't know. Let me see how much time I have. I have like uh, five minutes. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to go rather quickly. After this is basically going to be a, a identical to the argument of Zeldich. You write the wave trace that I, those wave trace coefficients, if you remember, they'll call them B, gamma, R, J, in the asymptotic that I wrote of the wave trace. So you can actually use a more general theorem of Zeldich that was actually for any domain that has a bouncing bar orbit. It doesn't, the, 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 no symmetry was used there. And you just apply your, uh, centrally symmetric, the central symmetry, and you get this expression as a corollary of that strong statement. Okay, some of these things, uh, they're unimportant. For example, the 4R, L, A, R is unimportant because the only function of R independent of the domain. These constants are also not important, the positive combinatorial constants. What's important, of course, we want to recover the Taylor coefficients. These are important. And we should look at those. And there are the, is inverse Hessian. Is a, these are the entries of the inverse Hessian that appear here and appear here and here. And we're going to use them to decouple uh, the expression and recover the Taylor coefficients from the, the wave invariance. So you see, uh, I, I divide both sides by this unimportant number here. And also there is a factor of H11 to the J minus two that appears here and is here and here. I divide by that because that was an spectral invariant because it only depends on A and A was an spectral invariant. If you divide it, and so you just get the square of that and which I factor and you get this whole thing plus this term, um, the sum of the cubic terms and the, this expression. And plus polynomial in terms of lower order Taylor coefficients, lower than this. So 2j minus 2. So this is an spectral invariant. So we like to recover this expression and this expression. And we know that it comes with uh, this, this Hessian elements. But if I show that those are independent from each other, you can recover the expressions in parentheses. So I take the ratio of that expression, the sum of the, the cubic terms, divide by that. Just divide by that. And I just want to show that this is not constant in R as a function of two of uh, the on the set of two elements, one and two. So I just want g of one to not be equal to g of two. If I know that, then I can actually get the expression in parentheses. Then you have a successful decoupling. So let's see what happens if they actually equal. If they equal to each other, this is very easy to compute because 
the, I wrote the matrices for you. Very easy to compute the inverse in terms of A, plug it in, and, and then you get this equation. It's just basically a polynomial equation if you multiply by the denominators. It becomes a degree six polynomial and the roots, distinct roots will be just four numbers. So if you're outside of this, if your A is not in this bad set, G of one is not G of two, therefore these things are become linear independent for R equal one and R equal two. Therefore you can recover these, okay? Uh, and that's, so do you want to recall, this is the last slide, sorry. Please, please go ahead, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. If you put J equal two here, you get F, the third order Taylor coefficient is square. And the lower order terms would have order two, but the second order Taylor coefficients are a spectral invariance. So that would be known if when J is two. So you get f cube is square here, and uh, also f cube is square here, but you get uh, the side, the, the third order Taylor coefficient is square, and here you get the fourth order Taylor coefficient. But these are independent, so you get the, the third order Taylor coefficient is square is an spectral invariant. That only tells you what this uh, up to a sign, but you fix a sign here and allow it to be positive. If it's negative, reflect it about the y-axis um, and make it positive. And you're only allowed to do that once. And for, after this, of course, you get F4 is determined. As I said, that, that would be this. Because if you know that and you know that, then you know that one, which would be F4. Then you just follow by induction. And note that that was the non-vertex assumption we used, that uh, the third order Taylor coefficient is non-zero. So once this expression is determined, because this is non-zero, then you have this expression is determined. And at the next step, of course, you, you take this becomes determined. And so the proof follows by uh, induction. Okay, so that's the end of the argument. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Hamid, for the very nice talk. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Please unmute yourself. Are there any questions or comments? So maybe just to see if I understood. So there's no convexity assumption since you only use the bouncing ball orbits? Right. So. Uh... Yeah, so we just need existence of a bouncing ball orbit. And uh, if the domain is convex, in fact, you can have two, like in this one, you always have two bouncing ball orbits. If it's convex, or in fact, if it's a star-shaped, then you always have two bouncing ball orbits. Mm -hmm. But uh, obviously this is not convex, so we, the convexity is not needed. And in fact, you don't even need it to be a star-shaped. As long as it's simply connected, you always have at least one bouncing bar orbit. Mm -hmm. In this domain, you have only one, you don't have two because the diameter goes outside. So we argue that as well, that there is always at least one bouncing bar orbit. And we only use that. But you want, uh, you want to know the length of that and you want to know that length and, is, and twice of that length are simple. Right, yeah, thanks. Uh, no convexity. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments? I, I have a question, Katya. Yes, please. So, I'm Petko. So, you Thank mentioned you. it about the Poisson relation, the result of Anderson and Melrose. Yes. This is also proof for strictly convex or strictly concave domain. This is proved later for arbitrary non convex domain in R2 and Rn by Petko Stoyanu. This is. Yes, you're absolutely, yeah, yes. yes, you're absolutely Petko right. Sorry. So, this is my first remark that uh, result under Sommer loss only for strictly convex to strictly convex domain. It depends on what side you consider. Thank you very much. You're absolutely right. 
It is the first. It's published it in two monographs, one in 92, other one in 2017. But it, there is fact, another result. That yes. The boson relation is uh, equality, becomes for, equality for, for generic domain, strictly convex domain in R2 and Rn. It's for, equality. So for, for it's, generic class, right? For generic, generic, yes. 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 Not analytic, but generic. This is described in our book. So it's, yes, uh, I have seen uh, I have seen those papers you mentioned. Also, I have seen your book. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I apologize, I missed that, and uh, I will definitely add it before I post the slides online. Thank you. And, and also when uh, in the class or in the generic class where you have equality, there is also some kind of map between two domains. We have the same spectrum and the same length spectrum. So is how to say, is characterized one orbit will be multiple reflecting ray. So it's because there is other one and uh, orbit is multiple reflected only if only it is isolated. So there's other things, but this is some kind of results that you could read there. I'm not going to make now the description. Uh, can you tell me please this the, the particular one you The result the convex dominion RN is not so trivial because there the poster relation includes the strictly convex domain strictly convex ray, uh, so reflecting rays, and also the orbit on the boundary. So you see the postal relation is something much more complicated. And, yes, uh, and if course, it's not convex, it's even more complicated because so you for, have Of course, for non-convex, there is another result about how to say the multiplicity. There is a result about the Poincare maps. This is for non-convex, but of course, for non-convex to prove equality is, is of course not so easy. This is probably very, very difficult, but there is how to say, so you can distinguish strictly convex domain and non-convex domain. For non-convex, there is some generic results, but for strictly convex domain, you can go very far. This means that you could make the Poisson relation for Rn, assume that you have R3, that includes the reflecting rays and orbit along the boundary. Nevertheless, the Poisson relation generically is equality. Yeah. So you actually, um, maybe I can make a comment. Yes. Uh, I was just writing to Stoyanov about the question whether the uh, the fact that the length L that we're interested in the bouncing ball orbit is an open dense condition. And he wrote me back just now that in one of your papers, a paper of uh, Petkoff and Stoyanov, they do prove that it's open dense. It's open dense. Yes. It, it, open dense. I, I'm just telling you actually to Hamid, because this was yes, a question yes, we were curious about. Respect to what, to what topology is? Well, C infinity actually, but he's not sure about the real analytic case, but he thinks the same proof. Yes. Open dense with respect to topology. What are doing? This is about the perturbation, which I've described, perturbation with the boundary. So, and this perturbation is uh, how to say generically with respect to how to say transversality theorem, but nevertheless, this is a transversality condition. So it is a little bit difficult to explain how, but this is generic condition. And this is generic condition that say that even for non-convex domain, you have several results. This means that, uh, how to say, I, I must say I per, per, are rationally independent. So, sorry, but I have to leave now because there's a hiring talk at my department and I have to, it starts right now. Okay. So I'm going to have to leave. No, okay. no, no problem. This is okay, just my so. remark that you, you could have attention in published result, which is not published, of course. Okay, bye. -bye. Uh, no, I, I appreciate, I, I'm, I'm very thankful you mentioned that. Uh, I will fix that in the lectures and also in the preprint we are writing. Thank you very much. I knew of your results and, and uh, because in the previous results, I only worked on convex domains. I, I always cited Anderson Merrill's, but here I don't assume convexity. So I had to, uh, to cite your result for non-convex domains. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments?
Any questions or comments? Okay, if not, thank you very much, Hamid, for the very interesting talk. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>